bigger box. Plus, I put handles on it so that if you want, I'll make you a new top and it's a picnic basket. Yeah, that's, that's a very fair price. It's a very fair price. price. That's, 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 that's right. Well, and I look at it because I saw it, it like I said, it's a tall eight. And I've yeah. made a few tall eights, and what I do is I make like knitting baskets out of them for my, my daughter, my niece. And what I'll do is I'll put cut dowels on the inside, and then I make a tray for the inside, and it sits on the dowels. And, and you glue them, I glue them, the little dowels on the inside, and it causes it to suspend. And that way you have a place you can put your knitting needles, scissors, things like that on the top, and you can store your wool underneath. I mean, if you really want, you could cut some slots, and that way you can feed the wool out without taking the top off. Um, but like I said, it, you know, again, the, it's not that hard to make, but if you don't hold the fingers, they tear, and then you lost a $28 piece of wood. Unless you want to cut it down and make button boxes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Who's got uh, who's got the what's on the end of the library table there? Fine. All right, well we're up. This is not completely finished yet, but it, it almost is. Um, so there's a joint still project that we, uh, a group build that we were doing, uh, what, four years ago? <laughs> is it that long ago? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's been a while. It's been a while. Um, I, I mean, uh, uh, this is my uh, version of it. I learned a lot. Um, uh, all I'll say is that uh, what I really want to just talk about uh, for a little bit is um, how to get over when you get stuck on a project. Because basically, um, when I was starting off this project, it was way easier than I thought it was going to be. Because you know, had the logs and we split them out. I was like, wow, that was super easy. And then uh, we took the wedges of the logs and planed out you know boards and the leg stack and said, wow, that was really easy too. And then I just said, okay, well now I got to figure out what to do in terms of like the decoration of it. And the main thing that I knew was that uh, in terms of mine was that I wasn't going to make it as tall as the other ones because I wanted this to be a footstool, not a stool to sit on. Uh, sit on. And the second thing is that, um, I don't know if you guys know or remember what the original design was like, but basically the legs would have been like turned with all kinds of beads and stuff like that. And my wife hates that sort of style. So I knew I couldn't do that. So I said, okay, well, I got to come up with a different design. And so I looked at the leg stock and looked at it and I put it down and I thought about it. And basically I thought about it so long that it turned from a greenwood project into a drywood project. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to uh, show how I finally uh, got over it. So step number one was I decided that I wanted, I needed to just get, you know, get this thing done. And the best way I could figure out how to get the thing done was I took all the parts of it and just dumped it on my workbench. Because the only way I was going to get my workbench back was to finish a project because I could get the parts off. Even with that, I did a whole lot of stuff just by shoving the stuff back and forth on the, on, on, on the workbench. But eventually I got to it. But the real th thing in terms of the design is that I, I wanted to um, uh, make not exactly a lamb's tongue, but like a straight bevel and, and, and a bevel over here. And where I was getting stuck was like, well, okay, fine, that's what I want. It's a pretty simple design, but how wide do I make these bevels? You know, do I start a quarter inch and half an inch, three quarters of an inch? I had no clue. Um, how, how many of you have uh, seen that uh, by um, uh, that uh, d design book that George Walker and Jim Tolpin put together, where they're talk uh, yeah. talking about all the dividers and, and stuff and using um, in, um, in, uh, um, whole number ratios to design things. That's actually what I wound up doing. Now, a lot of people hear about this book and they think that, oh, we're designing by formula and, there's, and, and, and who wants to do all that math? And it really isn't that hard. So basically, this is what I started off with, which is like, um, and I didn't want to use my leg blank, so I just you know, took some two by fours, glued them up, and made, made uh, uh, prototype like, like blanks over here. And this is how I figured out how to do this. So basically, I knew that there was going to be a length to this detail here, and that there was going to be a width to this detail here in terms of how uh, the width of the detail compared to the, uh, to the uh, entire width of the leg. And so I just picked some whole numbers. I said, okay, what if I chop this, thing, this side up into um, six divisions so that this comes in one sixth and this one comes in one sixth. And I tried that and I looked at it and I said, nah, too skinny, it's going to look like crap. 
So I said, okay, well, what do I do then? Well, six was too thin, so let's do five instead. So I chopped this up into five divisions, and I put the lines down and looked at it. And I said, oh, that looks better. So there's my answer for that side. And then in terms of how far in to put the the, um, uh, the little like straight lamb's tongue, I don't know what else to call it, the bevel, um, I said, okay, well, I got this length. Why don't I divide it up in eight parts and have one like that and one like that into the first part? And I looked at it and said, all right, I got lucky on the first try. And that's all I had to do. So after like, what, three years or so of looking at it, I, I did this in one evening. And then once I laid out the part, uh, once I laid out the parts, I quickly chopped it out just to see what it looked like, and I liked what it looked like, and then I did the rest of them. That's, that's that. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, all the um, corners are drawboard together, which is great because you don't have to use clamps. And I finished planing off the top. Every single hand tool I used uh, on this was Japanese, so if anyone says you can't use Japanese tools on hardwoods, it's a little crap. Um, and, uh, and now I have to figure out what kind of finish to put on it. So, I, uh, so after I analyze that, I imagine I'll have this project done by 2021. <laughs> so that's, that's all I got. So that's a lamb's tongue on a tongue depressor. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. How did you cut that? Chisel or? Ch chisel, yeah. So basically what I did was, um, I actually put a little quickie video on my blog if you want to look at it. But uh, basically what I did was, how did I do this? Oh, yeah. Um, so, so, I, uh, so I actually made, um, took a scrap of wood and cut a V in it uh, and, and dropped it in this way and just had a stop at this end. Uh, and, and that's all the work, work holding that I had. So the first thing I did was I took a, a saw and just made a bunch of saw cuts like this. And then I took a chisel and popped the waist out. So I was, after doing that, I was down to within, you know, easily less than an eighth. From, from, from my lines. Then I took a, um, a, a, a spokes shave and basically planed across the majority of this so I could get like the middle part of it close to the lines. And then there's a little bit of chisel work to finish off the flat part um, uh, at this end and then at this end and then a little bit more chisel work to just chop off the, uh, the bevel part. Um, and that was it. Um, the first one took me a long time. By the time uh, each one of them has four of them, so I had to do 16. By the time I was at number um, eight, I was knocking them out in about eight minutes each. So a couple evenings and stuff. Yeah. What kind of Japanese finishes? Oh, it's the Japanese finishes? Um, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. So, so the number one Japanese finish is actually bare wood. Uh, because there's something with planing, uh, with how the Japanese plane works, that actually burnishes the wood as it goes on, and then they just leave it bare, and that's the that's the finish. Um, the other uh, traditional Japanese finish is this uh, um, uh, opaque lacquer um, that um, apparently can kill you. So I'm not going to try using that. <laughs> um, I'm actually thinking more in terms of like you know boiled linseed oil and and or shellac or. Uh, uh, maybe water locks, I don't know. I, I'll just grab some scrap piece of wood and throw a bunch of finishes on them and see how it looks. Did you use one piece on top or did you use No, there, there's actually, um, these are actually two pieces um, lying somewhere in there. I don't know where it is, but yeah. Okay, when, when you uh, dress down the two pieces, yeah. if you're doing it all by hand, mm -hmm. how you dress it down? Oh, that, that's easy. Uh, basically what I did was, um, uh, I took one board, popped it up like this, planed pl pl it across so it was you know uh, square and, and, and flat across the top, and then I took like a really thin shaving just from the middle part, and so that um, there's a very 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 slight concavity uh, in it, really super thin. And then I did the same thing on the other side, and then basically, so uh, the reason for doing that is going to be a little bit exaggerated, but when the two boards go together, I'm guaranteed that the ends are going to stick. Uh, together, yeah. right? And there might be a little bit of a gap in the middle, but um, uh, once you, uh, once you put a little, some glue on it and the fibers swell up and you put a clamp across it, it generally disappears. Um, and and uh, and like I said, this is very very exaggerated. I mean, when I put the two boards together, I can sort of see that there's a gap because I can tell the difference between how the ends touch and what the middle looks like, but I still can't see any daylight between the t uh, between the two gaps. So that's how thin that. That thing is. It's well, called a spring if joint. You, if yeah. you taper it a little bit and you're a little off, mm -hmm. you might see a gap on one end, on yeah. one side, right. but not on the finish. Well, well that's side. why you scoop out the middle because then you're guaranteed that the ends are going to you know, close up. Yeah. So that's called a spring joint. It's um, a pretty common way of doing glue ups. I like doing it because it saves a lot of trouble. Because it's a lot easier to make something not flat than it is to make it flat. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What's that made of? What? what is that? It's uh, red oak. Um, and and um, oh, oh, that's the other thing I should probably 
point out. I don't know if you can see this, but if I, if you want to come up and look at it, you can see like this like amazing ray fleck, and that's because I started with by splitting it. I mean, I never liked red oak uh, up until when I split uh, split this thing, and uh, and and this figure is so good. I I actually can't remember a piece of white oak that I've ever seen with this much ray fleck uh, in, in it. So um, yeah. Since you did everything right, you can't. How did you cut? You made a cut. With a saw? Just hand saw. Japanese hand saw? Yeah. God bless you. They're awesome. It's not that much work. People think that it's a lot of work, but they're wrong. That's right. practice easy recast? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I mean, um, Going back to when I was first starting, I remember the first thing I made with dovetails was a box, right? And um, and so I cut one. You know, so I, I, I actually start off with a long board and wrapped it around, so like the board you know, and pieces went around. So I cut my first dovetail, cut my second dovetail, third dovetail, fourth, you know, fourth dovetail. You took the box. If you rotate it, you can actually see my dovetails getting better as you <laughs> as you go <laughs> counterclockwise <laughs> around the box. So, I mean, I'm just saying that because yeah, the more you practice it, something the, the better you get. Like I said, the first one of these took me a while to figure out the best way. Of, of doing it, but, but like I said, by the time I was halfway through, I was knocking them out in eight minutes each. So, I've nice job. Yeah. The tails you should warm up before you actually do the real work. Or just do it. How is the top going to be attached to it? Oh, yeah. Um, basically, um, the way that it's usually done is drill a hole in the top you know, that goes into probably where the legs are because that's the biggest target and just pegs to hold it in. Yeah. But you'll split the top that way. Hmm? I said you'll split the top that way. No, I won't. It's quarter so on to start with, so it's not going to move. Gonna move. Uh, no, I won't. Yeah, and that's how Fallon's did it, so. Yeah. It'll be fine. Yeah. Like I said, it's been sitting around long enough that it's actually stable. <laughs> Stable yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, who's next? It's coming down the line. Yeah. Who's next? You want to help with the second one? Oh, right. Where's the line? You want to help him with the uh, second one? Two wine racks. Wine racks. Oh, wine racks. Uh, yeah. White and red. Good idea, yeah. Just gave me no idea. Uh, this is Sapili, uh, the scrap from the scrap bin. Uh, piece of copper on the top. Mm. Nice. Nothing, no fancy jewelry, it's just nails and screws. Um, Yay. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it with that one. The, and the tops are mitered? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, just like the molding. This is store-bought molding. Ah. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, Your own design? Yeah. How do you fashion the copper? Uh, this, <coughs> this is just like, there's like a groove in this piece of molding here. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's actually like press fit. Press it. Can, can you, you press tilt it? that down? Yeah. Press it by hand? Um, well, it, it's one piece. See, it fold, it uh, folds up the bevel, and then it, it folds back down hmm. into a groove in the molding. How, how did, you, uh, did you did you hammer it into place with a tool? No. Or? no. You got, you got no. a break? Yeah. Uh, in, in theory, if you have a break, it, it seems like it's easy, but the next time I do one of these, I'm going to start the metal first and build outward because yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to go from the outside in. It's easy to go from inside out. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that one. Um, this one is cedar. This is actually my mailbox post. This, uh, he said the, ce the cedar crushes. So this was this was extremely hard to get it in the groove here without crushing anything. Um, yeah. The moldings. Well, too. I by that. If you try to make a mortar. Yeah, at each of each, you, you try to do anything. Or and then if there's like a little piece of a little, little, little shave of like wood, yeah, puts like a dent in it. So it's it's, it's more or less like a re like for recycled. Yeah. Um, 
Looks great. Is this, so, for, you, well, is this for you? I mean, is this, is this for, for your home? Um, Do you drink a lot of wine? No. <laughs> I, mean, a lot, I, 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 yeah. I give it to people. Oh, okay. To clients, um, whatnot. Um, and you give one to me? <laughs> so that's where, so, well, that's where, so, that's where so, this was going. <laughs> well, I'm still trying to understand the, the, I'm still trying to understand the bevels in the copper tray. How did you bend the bevels accurately? Um, in, um, not necessarily like a siding break, uh, a sheep, uh, a box a metal break. break? <coughs> yeah, metal break. Um, picture a U, you can bend a U, you know, four, three sides. Yeah. Um, and then you bend the other side. The, the, break, you, the, the break is actually like a finger break. You'd have like a, let's say this whole thing is solid. The width of your U, like your, your, bar, your pan, you take these two fingers out so the sides would go in so it wouldn't crush it as you bend the, the third and fourth side. Um, so you had access to a, to a finger break then? Yeah, that's what I use for it, yeah. Um, but this, this molding was, uh, I made this, this is two pieces because they don't make cedar molding. Um, and again, the next time I'm going to make the metal first because it's easier to shave wood, uh, you know. Yeah, the bend metal. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, because if, if you make the wood precise, it, it, metal, if it's like a 30 second off, it, it, it's not going to work. And, and, and um, just nails. Um, this is a this is a tip. This was my mailbox post. Now, I. What's holding up your mailbox? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this, okay. this is what happened. Copper pipe. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I've okay. been in the house since the mid 50s. Okay. The mailbox has been across the street down the street, the edge of the drive. It's been in like four different places, okay? So I bought this piece, dug a hole, a couple inches high, put a block of wood on it, pounded it down, okay, put it on there. It stood there for 20 years, okay? Somebody backed in the driveway, turned around, they knocked it down. My wife says, well, throw it out. I said, no, I'll make something. So. <laughs> like uh, like you said, you put the stuff like the cedar in the in the ground. If you put stone under there, somebody once told me that it doesn't rot out. But it rotted out. It maybe like this much. So I was gonna do I was gonna do a big crown molding job, big crown molding. I bought a hundred dollar saw blade, okay, and I was using this post in, in pieces as like a support on either end of my chop saw, moving them around. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a nice job. Didn't even use the blade yet. I went to cut the saw, cut the four by four where it was rotted, and sparks went flying. Oh, metal. <laughs> and I'm, I'm saying, what the heck did I hit? Because I bought the four by four to put yeah. it on the ground, right? What did I hit? It was a piece of angle iron, about this big, about this thick. Do you know oh, the plate. that when I put that mailbox post in, I put it in the exact spot that it was in, in the 50s. Like, really? I pounded that in the first time. Really? really? Right? The, the odds right? are like, like zero. <laughs> <laughs> because when I wanted to put the, I went, I upgraded. It was six by six. When I went to dig it out again to go a little deeper, I found a rotten piece of angle iron. I said, son of a bitch, so. <laughs> Check the wood. Uh, <laughs> with, a, with, with an x-ray machine. How about the hundred dollar blade? Well, this was actually free because it was broken, but it cost me a hundred dollar blade. <laughs> I thought I was doing good. You could have sent it back and said it was defective. You should always listen to your wife. I'll tell you to throw it away. <laughs> That's it. Why are they two different heights? Yeah. I think because this was a scrap bed, and this one has a taper. Yeah. And I had one leg where I couldn't do it, so I had to, I had to use that leg because this I did this one first. Very nice. That's it. Very nice. Very nice. Jerry, listen to his wife. Jerry, listen to his wife. There's a good lesson.
It's a laptop stand. This is a uh, night table for a bedroom. A uh, number of years ago, I did a, uh, a sleigh crib for my grandson. I had two grandsons, different mothers, four weeks apart. So I made cribs for them. They were sleigh design, white oak. Uh, when they got big enough, I converted it into sleigh beds, got rid of the sides, put in rails, made the bed bigger. Uh, I also made a chest of drawers. And then uh, they needed a night table. So I had some scrap oak. Uh, I didn't have uh, enough stock for the legs, so I glued up the legs. I got some nice straight green for the facing forward. Uh, I guess this is white oak that I made for the drawer. Somehow it, it, it's a different, different color, but then I got some nice uh, not free pine, made the drawer, and everything's mortised and tenoned. Uh, the top is held in with buttons. And I put this little bead around there just to make it a little fancier. So all nailed in. Stain, and uh, can anybody guess the finish? <laughs> so, uh, and then I, I wax it. And it's, a, it's the height of the mattress, so it helps a nice lamp. And everybody's happy with it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. When you put the show after the, the shellac dry, which doesn't take long, uh, do you steel wool it down or do you use a fine, fine sandpaper? Just uh, 4 0 steel wool. 4 0. I put the steel wool mm -hmm. right in a can of wax and uh, rub it out. It's about three coats of shellac. I don't sand in between the coats. Uh, <coughs> The thing that you have to be careful of when you stain a piece is, uh, and you put shellac on it, the last thing you want to do is go through the shellac and hit the stain. Because then you're going to go back to the bare wood, and that's the disaster. You know, there's no way to come back from that. So I, I never sand between coats. I just put shellac on, wait a half hour, put another coat on, wait a half hour, put another coat on. Maybe two or three days later, I'll put the wax on, rub it out, and you know, everybody that when you somebody sees it, the first thing they do is they go, "Ooh, that's nice," <laughs> and uh, it is nice. The other thing uh, that I brought samples of uh, this is something that came about by accident. Uh, everybody's got those little toaster ovens and you put a couple of English muffins in there or some white bread to toast and you open it up and you put your hand in to get the toast <laughs> and you hit the, that red hot bar and my wife kept on doing it and I says, when are you going to learn to add a fork or something? Stop putting your hand in there. So uh, then I came up with this idea that it's a mini pizza peel uh, and it's designed like say this is the toaster oven you got the toast in there, you just go right in there, and the toast comes right out. I can do two English muffins, uh, it's four pieces in one shot. The only thing you got to be careful is you don't want to tip it. Go with mine. Yeah, the toast right there. So this is done from all my scrap wood. Uh, I started by... When I first started doing this, I started milling the wood down to the thickness that I wanted. And then I tried gluing it up. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> we'll wait. <laughs> Stop. I don't know. Who knows? Okay, so to try to glue this up and keep it flat, forget about it. It's not going to happen. So. I like the idea of book matching, so what I do is I glue this, this, and this, 
as a three quarter inch piece. And that makes it a lot easier to glue up. Then I band saw it in half, and then I got my two sides. Uh, and then this piece, I have to uh, make the thickness of this, but then it makes it a lot easier to glue up, because you're only gluing up the three pieces. Uh, and this would go down the whole length, and then I just freehand the design, make the curves. Uh, then again, originally when I made this, I was doing this on, I had a, a reciprocating belt sander. So I tried doing it with that, and that was a terrible mess. Uh, so then I was able to clamp this on my bench, and with plane, I can make that curve and get a nice knife edge. You need a knife edge for it to get under your, your bread or pizza. And uh, I guess I did this before I made the final width, because when you're going across the grain like that, you're going to get tear out. It's going to splinter on the ends. So you need to do that first. And it's got a little bit of a curve. And I never have any problem getting the bread out. I can do uh, an Italian bread, a pizza, just get it in there, a nice sharp. And this is my little manta ray. I like the way the two lies. And this one uh, is for pizza. If you do it out on the grill, you know, if you make a pizza, you need to have that little cornmeal on there so it slides off. And I've never used it. Yes. Yeah. Never been uh, pizza. You don't and have the heart to stick it on the grill. Well, I have another one. I have another one. So this is uh, this is made. I make the the handle a little thicker because of the, the weight of it, and then we just. Uh, with a chisel, I just work down the edge so it's rounded off a little bit. And uh, they're nice. I give them out as gifts. I know people here that have gotten them. But if you want, I'll pass this around. And you get one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not. Sign it sheet. <laughs> we can pass these around if anybody wants to see them. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. That's a beautiful. Thank you. I'm getting hungry holding it. This is my rendition of a classic shaker. Um, cabinet, meant to hang on the wall. Uh, original plans I found were in fine woodworking. It's a, a Christian backsource yeah. version. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, things you don't see is there's uh, dovetails top and bottom covered over, but it makes it rigid. Um, basically, this whole thing was one piece of wood. I just cut it all down except for the top after the cat started chewing on it. So it, it, all the grain is nice and straight. Um, I tried to <coughs> pick the better pieces for the doors and styles and all. Um, I still have three pieces on the inside. Most of this is half inch or less for the door, for the back, for the shelves. So it's, it's nice and light. Uh, proportions seem to work pretty well. Um, it's a pretty simple design. Basic uh, uh, frame and panel door, um, dovetails, you know, it's the edges here I did with uh, hand planes. Yeah. Nice. Um, the turn a little shaker peg for the handle. What are you that's the do only piece the I haven't done. I haven't decided whether I just do the turn or whether I do the, the turn oh, when the it goes turn. through. You're going to have, have a catch. Huh? I like the turn. The, the traditional for this is a, is a catch. Uh -huh. What they normally do is they don't do frame and panel. They do a solid door right. with battens on the back. And it would cinch nails, and then they usually just have a simple turn. Uh -huh. That's the traditional way of doing it. A bed Actually, nail? If the, the book that we have here, that's the way they draw it out. Um, it's a nice little project. Um, I did it in pine, which is you know one of the classic ways they do it. That or, or cherry. Are you stain it? Huh? Uh, it's actually got a very light coat of shellac on it right now. Yeah. Um, 
I've been toying whether a shellac it or they do milk paint a lot of times. So uh, there's, there's a version of this in uh, Pop Woodworking where they did in uh, like a bright red and milk paint and it looks pretty sharp. So nice. haven't decided but it's just a nice little project. Uh, yeah. You get to practice pretty much all your basic joints. And, uh, did you cut the uh, hinge mortises with a chisel? Uh, yeah. That's fussy and pine. It is. You have to have really sharp chisels. Yeah. Uh, kind of like what they're describing with the cedar, yeah, it will crush. And you got to be really careful because you can nick it and dent it really easy. And my, like I said, my cat started chewing on the end of it, and I was like, oh my god, wow. You know, she literally chewed the corner right off of it. It was very tasty. Uh, apparently so. <laughs> it was very good. She did both sides. So. At any rate, that was um, very fair. But that's uh, the latest nice. project I've been very working nice. on. Very nice. Plant stand I made for my parents for Christmas. Uh, hand tool, uh, did it all with hand tools. Uh, made out of cherry, uh, uh, haunch mortises, uh, haunch tenons, mortises, uh, tapered legs. Uh, top is uh, attached with uh, turn buttons. And the finish, it's got a little uh, bead detail down here on the bottom of the aprons. And uh, it's finished with uh, tried and true uh, varnish oil. Nice. And uh, I guess Bob Ortiz was here uh, last. And so, you know, he's, he said you should uh, sand the end grain down to, with 400. So I did that. So I got like a nice, uh, the end grain's not really obvious, as obvious as, uh, you know, might be. So, How did you cut the bead? I had this, uh, I'm a Paul Sellers uh, aficionado. And he has a, this poor man's beading tool. It's just a block of wood with a screw in it, like a slotted screw. Uh -huh. And then I file that screw down, give it a nice sharp edge, and just you know, run it across, and a little sandpaper gets the, gets the beat on it. Did you design this? Yeah, yeah I drew it out on a uh, piece of uh, craft paper, you know, and full size. And just uh, uh, w when it looked right, I uh, committed to the wood. So. Your parents are probably wondering why there are plants on the floor. Yeah, <laughs> I stole it back. You got to pay your back. How did, you, how did you decide on the paper? Uh, I just like when I drew it out, what looked good. So I think this is an inch and a quarter up here, maybe, and down down here it goes to uh, three quarters three of an quarters. inch. So mm -hmm. I just uh, yeah. and you cut that taper by hand. Is yeah, that? yeah, with a yeah with a rip saw, five five. Uh, TPI rip saw, and then you know hand plane, of course. After that, to oh, no, get all nice. the very nice. It's very nice. It's got a great stance. It's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm good. For I'm happy with it. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Nice. You should be it's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> that brings me. So you got you got finished furniture a month or two ago. So today I brought a. Um, uh, a uh, shop project. Um, so this is uh, this is my. Uh, you guys have seen William's uh, uh, very uh, uh, Swiss cheese bench. complicated <laughs> Swiss cheese bench on bench. This is my uh, answer to it. It's pretty similar to the the uh, you know a lot of people have been you know, the Moxon twin screw and basically a, a, a clamp that you just clamp on top of your uh, workbench. Uh, this is a slightly. Um, uh, has some other functionality. It's basically a bench on bench, uh, is how I, I think of it. And I got my design from, I think it was uh, uh, his name, uh, Jeff uh, Miller. Uh, Miller in Chicago. I had an article a couple of years, like, like 10 years ago, <laughs> five one working. Uh, and I thought this was a, a good design. Uh, the um, uh, the top is is uh, is a pretty hefty chunk of uh, hard maple. Uh, you know, it's uh, three boards basically laminated for most of the body, and then the, the back of the uh, vise is, is, a, is part of the glue up, and, uh, um, and then the vise jaw uh, on the front end uh, is cambered a little bit, so it's a little bit looser fitting uh, in, the, uh, in the ends than it is in the middle. So when you, so when you clamp down on the screws, um, the, um, 
you know, the, the, the vise bites a little bit more in the center before, it, before it's tight on the edges, um, which, is, which is nice because if you're not using the full uh, width between the screws, it basically will hold pretty tight in the center of it. Uh, I believe it's 18 inches between the screws, so uh, it's big enough. Um, uh, I, I originally put it together thinking that I was going to um, use it to dovetail uh, a, a bookcase together. And, um, uh, and uh, the, uh, the idea was that I could basically put a whole slab side or a top of the case inside, uh, uh, inside the jaws and it'll fit pretty tight. Uh, since then, you know, I've done a couple of other bigger pieces. The last piece I did, you know, you guys saw that the dovetails on that were uh, a little, they were a little under 18, but, uh, but, the, but the long pieces were so tall, I would have had to, uh, actually had to build a box and stand on a ladder uh, to do it. And it, it, this is just not as tight. Um, but, uh, but for most of my projects, I do use it for dovetailing. It's also very handy if I'm doing any kind of routing. Because, uh, you know, routing, my bench is lower for hand planing and I'm not that tall. But if I want to use, uh, but if I want to use a hand tool, I want to get closer to work with more control, uh, I, I, this basically gets me up to a height that's comfortable for, uh, you know, my elbow is about flat, you know, hands on across this top. Uh, and same thing with routing. Um, one of the cool things about, I, I like about it is for larger pieces, so the way it, the way it attaches, uh, to my bench, you know, or any bench, you can basically just clamp the, the legs on this, or basically just tees of plywood that are dadoed and glued up, you know, with a top uh, rail and a bottom piece, and they extend out a little bit wider on the on the ends than they than than, uh, than the top. So if I you know you basically pinch it between a couple hold fasts. Uh, you can clamp it with uh, regular F clamps. Uh, you can even, I mean, depending on what you're doing, you can even just pinch it between dogs uh, on the ends and it won't problem. Now, the, the, one of the things I like about it is that if I clamp a board up in a piece of uh, stock and it's going to hang down, I can basically line up the back jaw with my bench edge and, uh, and it basically gives me uh, support behind the workpiece where it's level with the front of my bench. Um, I don't know, what else? I, uh, the, the hardware on this, Tools for Working Wood sells the hardware. It's, it's actually got a, um, there's a couple things that are, that are a little bit different than just basically the handles you might buy or the screw you might buy. It's an acne thread, so it's a pretty tough uh, threaded post. But it also has sort of a, um, it has a domed washer behind uh, each of the handles so that, you know, it bites into the front jaw a little bit, but not so much so that then you can't back it out without uh, loosening the nut that's, wedged in behind the back jaw. Um, the other thing about this is that if, if, like, for instance, you tighten it up and the handle's up top and it's sort of in your way, you can pull it out and it'll ratchet uh, so you can point the handles any way you want once it's tight. How misaligned can you do? How much of what? Misalignment, or it's just for flat pieces. Oh, you mean in terms of, uh, in terms of like, racking? Yeah. Uh, the vice, you know, if, it, if I had a tapered piece in it, um, you know, it'll, It'll take some taper and it'll still bite. I mean, it's a wide enough jaw that it'll put pressure on it. Um, I find that it's. I find that I like it best if if I'm using a very small piece and it's like to one side for some reason. I'll put a, a, a um, you know I'll put a, another piece the same width as the stock I'm working on at the other end so that I'm getting even clamping pressure across both. Um, the only yeah I'm trying to think if there's any other um, and, and a nice wide platform in back. You know, the current, a lot of the mock devices you see in the, you know, the popular woodworking model that's sort of made popular is very shallow. You know, it's basically a back jaw and a front jaw with a couple of ears to pin it to your bench, but it doesn't necessarily have a platform behind. The beauty of this is, like, say, for instance, I've already cut my uh, uh, tails, and now I want to mark my pin board uh, for dovetailing. I can, I can clamp the pin board level and, and flat in the jaw and put my tailboard on top of it and it's got a nice flat bearing surface uh, behind. I can put a, you know, if I even want to pitch it up a little bit, I can put a platform where it's level with the front of the workpiece and I can, you know, I've got full support all the way back. I mean, I've done it with, you know, even if you have a piece that's three or four feet long, you know, if, I, if I've got it resting on top of the pinboard in front and I clamp it on top of the platform in back, I don't know a problem. 
it'll, it'll support that. Another way to approach that problem is what I did. Mine, mine's only about nine inches wide. So, you know, for something long, right. it wants to fall down and back. Right. I took some two by fours and made myself an eight shaped support. Thing that was the same height and you clamp it to the back of the bench. Right. Um, I've only made one set of legs, but one of the things that Jeff Miller suggested in Argo is you can make lots of different leg sets. So if I wanted another foot up, I could make taller uh, plywood H's. They're just screwed into the bottom of the bench top. You just unscrew them, put another set of legs on it that are taller, shorter, um, you know, whichever. Uh, you know, or I could get them to adjust, adjust the bench. But, uh, but in terms of, uh, my only real complaint is I wish I'd made it just a hair larger. I wish I'd put maybe 24 inches between the screws. Yeah, we all do. That's it. Right. So, and I, I don't know if anyone else, so I actually even drew my favorite uh, dovetail uh, angle right on the top of it. So I can basically, every time I, every time I get ready to do a set of dovetails, I can basically just put my bevel square on the top of the bench and set it up to one and seven. Nice, nice, nice. nice. Yeah, let's take a 10 minute break ten now and we'll do the other half of the room when we get back. 10 minute break. Alright. Alright. We got talent. We got talent. Alright.